Listen to some of your favorite shows ad-free with Stitcher Premium, like Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend, My Favorite Murder, Science Rolls with Bill Nye, and more. Plus, get access to Stitcher Originals, bonus episodes, comedy albums, and more. Just $4.99 a month. Go to stitcher.com slash premium and use promo code THEWILDLIFE for one month free. This is Devin, and you're listening to The Wildlife, a show hosted by two brothers that tells nature's untold stories and wild secrets. It just so happens to also be our 48th episode without Ryan Reynolds as a guest to compare and contrast real Wolverines with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, which I think is a a golden idea. It was one that was uh, come up with by high schoolers. So, so Ryan, if you, uh, if you fulfill that, if you um, hit us up, Zoom call, Skype phone, doesn't matter. Um, you are you are fulfilling the dreams of a bunch of high schoolers. So just going to throw that out there. Do it for the children. At the top, I also want to thank our patrons, Andrea Lloyd, Megan Gariani, Chris Trenkel, Matt Capel, and Bridget Fitzgerald. Genuinely, truly, you are the ones who make this possible. We are also working on a bit of a care package for you. So uh, if you're listening right now, know that you've got something on the way. I think we could all use a little something something in uh, in these times and, and you know one of those things that you need we are we're, these are these are these are very weird and strange times I think to to put it lightly we wake up and we are inundated with numbers and tolls and rates and um, you know normally, Normally, what we do, we talk about concepts like like the air we breathe and metamorphosis, or or maybe we talk about specific species or sets of animals like penguins and velvet worms. Um, and and often in those episodes, we end up we throw out a lot of facts and numbers and statistics, and I, I just don't think that we need more of that right now. And and some of the episodes that we had planned. While we could make some tie-ins, like for the fact that we have a uh, an episode on snow leopards coming up, and of course the big the big pop culture thing right now is Tiger King. Um, we um, we wanted to take a break from our from our status quo, and we wanted to do something a little bit different. Right now, in this time of six feet apart, self isolation, quarantining at home, um, like for example, uh, my wife and I are both teachers. We are doing distance learning, and so largely us, as, as well as our, our children, are just home, and I do errands when need be. Um, it's it's weird. It's a new normal to get used to, and I think the thing that we all need right now, as is being demonstrated by the amazing things that I keep seeing on social media um, and, and from different friends and family, uh, and, and the popularity of things like Zoom... Um, is that we just need connection. We need connection and we need conversation. And so today, today we're bringing you a conversation. Now in the past, sure, we've mentioned at the tops of some episodes how, oh, largely we're just going to play the con- the conversation. Um, in this episode, we are genuinely just playing the conversation. It's a conversation about conservation. It's a conversation about um breaking down barriers of exclusivity. It's a conversation about birds. It's a conversation about a lot of things. And it's an amazing conversation with Karina Newsom, aka Hood Naturalist, zookeeper turned biologist. Now, if you aren't following her on social media, you need to do that right about now. I'll even give you a second. Okay, you better have used that second to actually follow her. Of course, you could just, you know, pause it or do it after the episode. Anyway, I've been following her on social media for a couple of years actually, and in that time uh have just have just seen a lot of um a lot of really amazing stuff. Uh, she has a way of communicating science um that's really relatable um and and accessible and um one of the one of the first things that I saw of hers was a parody video about birding and when I saw the video I was like, okay, she she is going to make some waves. She's going going to make it. She's going to get a lot of people 
into nature and into science. And you know what? She absolutely has. Karina Newsom is a graduate student studying biology with a focus on avian conservation. She's worked in the field of wildlife conservation for eight years, first as a zookeeper specializing in animal training and environmental education, and currently as a field biologist working to conserve the McGilvery Seaside Sparrow. Having experienced the hurdles faced by people of color and interested in wildlife careers, Karina has founded several programs to encourage high school students from underrepresented demographics to consider careers in wildlife sciences. Karina grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and has always had a desire to participate in and advocate for the conservation of wildlife and natural spaces, and to encourage people of color in the U.S. to explore the great outdoors. So, use this as a chance to uh, turn off the TV, take a break from the news on COVID, coronavirus, and um, just kick it back. Listen to a conversation and, and participate vicariously. <laughs> Get ready for Karina Newsom, the one, the only, the hood naturalist. Um, your, your, your Twitter bio. Um, I love your Twitter bio because it says zookeeper turned biologist. And, and I love that because in part, I think it's, it's something where a lot of people kind of use those words interchangeably where they go, oh, I mean, a zoo, zookeeper, I mean, that's, that's a biologist, right? Or, or they kind of just assume there's a lot of assumptions in biology and nature and stuff that people are a certain thing or do a certain thing. And there's a lot of other layers where more oniony than that. Um, but, uh, but also because it's, it's, it works really well as an attention grabber because saying like zookeeper turned biologist, it's like, wow, wait, zookeeper, what, what, what do you do as a zookeeper? How did you become a zookeeper? And then biologists, like, what are you doing as a biologist? There's just so many other wonderings that kind of pop up there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, what, what, what is your story? Yeah. So, uh, I, and to be clear, zookeeping yeah. is definitely like a science career. Like you are yeah. doing the science, right? But, uh -huh. um, I, really was not growing up wasn't very familiar with a lot of you know science related careers outside of say like veterinary medicine when it comes to wildlife even though mm -hmm. i had the desire to work with wildlife and um so i kind of just took the veterinary path for a while like through high school and then a family friend of mine who was a black woman who was a zookeeper she reached out to me and asked if i wanted to shadow her at the zoo and go behind the scenes with her and see what she does yeah. And maybe intern at the zoo. And I had actually never even been to the zoo at that point. I was uh, 17. I'd never been to the zoo. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, uh, sure. But like I, I had my interpretation of zoos that they were like, you know, yeah, like a like 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 a joke or kind of like a like corny. <laughs> and why would I ever go to the zoo? And yeah. it turns out she was the lead carnivore keeper. And I found out that zoos are conservation organizations. Yeah. Which changed the game for me. And I fell in love with zoo science and kind of my trajectory took off from there. And so in college, I majored in zoo and wildlife biology. Um, and then after that, that's when I really started my zookeeping career. Um, I did internships sure. in college, but then once I graduated, I was you know, a full time keeper. Um, and that essentially looks like a lot of different things, depending on what you do as a keeper. I was an ambassador animal keeper. So mm -hmm. I was taking care of a really wide variety of animals from um, invertebrates like spiders and, you know, cockroaches and yeah. other other uh, um, animal species from kind of that group to amphibians and reptiles to birds like raptors and parrots to mammals like a variety of carnivores like leopards, lynx, wow. you know, other cats, yeah. sloths, a variety of different <laughs> kinds of creatures. But all of these animals that they had in common was that, that they are... Um, they participate in education. And so in some yeah. capacity, whether it be through animal shows or through uh, programs in schools, they are part of the education initiative of the zoo. And so mm -hmm. I was doing both animal care and animal training, as well as education. And that was my job for about four years. Um, and then while I was there, I, I was really kind of, I had the itch to, 
to participate more in the uh, the research element of conservation because um, I was more on the you know the the hands on husbandry and dissemination of information side of conservation, which is a very important side. Um, but I wanted to participate more in the um, research element. So I decided yeah, to go back yeah. to school. Um, so I went back to school, which is what I'm doing right now. And so I, um, that's kind of where I say, you know, zookeeper turned biologist, because now my focus is on research, asking yeah. questions, collecting data, and, you know, coming up with answers, essentially, to the questions that I ask. And so that involves uh, you know, full-time dedication to that effort. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm, uh, my, my life essentially is consisting of, you know, taking classes, of course, but most of yeah. it is being out in the field. Um, my study site is uh, located in the salt marshes of Georgia. Um, and I researched the seaside sparrow. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm out in the marsh collecting data on the seaside sparrows for my specific question. And um, to, at the end of my degree, which will hopefully be in December, I will have, you know, my whole, uh, research uh, question answered and yeah. you know published yeah. and finished and um, after that I intend to go back into zoo science but kind yeah. of existing more at the intersection of conservation and public outreach. Yeah, yeah, that's a good mix. It's a good uh, 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 like uh, they. I feel like one really can't fully exist without the other, and yeah. uh, if you can do something with both, well, mm -hmm. there you go. Um, actually, it brings. It, I already have like 75 questions first off, but um, <laughs> we were talking to a snow leopard expert yesterday and it was really interesting because um, he was saying that he started as a physicist. Oh, and wow. Caught me really off guard because I was like, wait, what? Hmm. And really interesting because he, he was talking about how he uh, like 20 years ago, like before Merlin bird ID or anything like that was around, uh, he locally in I, I'm blanking on where but in somewhere in uh, Asia uh, for friends and family, like made a local, like, uh, image, image, image of what I'm blanking on why I'm really butchering this, but, um, the same kind of thing, like Merlin bird ID, just for uh -huh. local species. And he had like that going. And then somebody contacted him and was like, Hey, this, you know, you could do some stuff with ecology. And he was like, oh, okay. And then kind of made the switch. And now he's been doing snow leopard stuff for a really long time. And, uh, just sort of that, uh, uh, you know, being able to take different experiences and say, rather than saying, oh, I can't do these other things because I have mm -hmm. this other experience, finding ways to blend them. So, yes, I think that's yeah. the most enriching way to even contribute to conservation in general is to have all kinds of different experiences and tools under your belt. Yeah. Yeah. So you said uh, to back up just a tad, you had said you originally were doing veter veterinary. What got you on that? And why did you why did you go away from that? Yeah, well, I so I had always wanted to work with wildlife, but like I said, I I was not familiar with any career outside of veter veterinary mm -hmm. medicine. And so, starting in middle school, I started volunteering at my local animal hospital in Philadelphia, oh, okay. and I was definitely doing things I wasn't qualified to do. Uh, I'll say that <laughs> now. <laughs> um, I won't say what I was doing, but I shouldn't have sure. been doing them. But anyway, yeah. it was like great hands-on experience, like very in the mix. And then mm -hmm. I was doing that for five years, like through high school. And then one day in the middle of a spay procedure, so when you take the uterus out of, it was a cat yeah. at this time, um, I passed out. And I've oh, seen no. hundreds of spays, <laughs> like yeah. was totally used to it, but something about that day, I passed out and I could not look at another surgery. And so it was oh, really no. like, I, I started panicking. And so the family friend that I mentioned who reached out, yeah. reached out at the zoo, it's because she heard that I was in this crisis. You know, I was like about yeah. to graduate high school and I had no idea what I was going to do. I was, I went yeah. from being totally sure to having no idea so yeah. that's that's what happened yeah i think that's that's probably an experience that a lot of people can relate to <laughs> in <and of laughs> yeah. <itself. laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah oh gosh i yeah and then oh my gosh i'm just thinking about like college and some of the smells that <laughs> made me so nauseous mm -hmm. and i sometimes every once in a while smell something in public and i'm like why does it smell like that there's no yeah. reason that that smell should be out here <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> yeah, and once that association is made, it's like yep. you really can't shake it. <laughs> uh, um, so, so uh, I, I mentioned before I kind of have been, you know, following your stuff for, for quite a while. And one of the things, um, and I'm sure that you're asked about this all the time. Uh, one of the things that I had seen you post that kind of said to me right away, I was like, okay she's got something here. She's got, she's got talent in the in communication of this. 
uh, was your parody video. <laughs> I love that parody video. It's great. <laughs> and I, it's one that I've shown to my students and stuff. Oh, I my also, God. I teach high school. Oh um, yeah. And I've shown it to my students and stuff, and they love it. And oh uh, what what is the what's the story behind that? Like, what was your motivation to? And I oh love the man. song choice too. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so like I'm a huge Cardi B fan, and so yeah. like I just I'm always rapping Cardi verses, just like on my free time and not yeah. free time. And so one of my friends who was mm-hmm. also at the same university of me, Antarius McLean, a bur- a birder, black guy. Yeah. Um, and he was a, he's a producer actually, he's a music producer oh. and a biologist. So very cool combination. Well, that's a there. cool combo. Yeah. 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 Very cool. And um, so one day we were. I, I had just like a Cardi B line from Clout, the song mm-hmm. by Offset and Cardi B, like a, a bird rendition of a single line popped in my head. So I texted him that. I was like, oh, that's funny, isn't it? And we went back and forth texting alternative bird lines to her whole verse. Yeah. And like within, you know, a couple hours, we had the whole thing yeah. <laughs> birded up. And so we, you know, <laughs> so then we're like, oh, this is funny. And then we're like, should we make a video? And we had no time for this. Like this was in the yeah. middle of like, what is it, midterms and something like that? Like oh, so you're procrastinating. I oh, see. yeah. So, like, we totally <laughs> have things we needed to be doing, but we're like, yeah. let's do <laughs> everything but what we need to do and make a yep. music video about birds remixed by Cardi B. So, like, yeah, it was totally by accident on the whim, and within 48 hours, we had a remade verse, recorded it in his, like, home studio, and then, <laughs> and then made a video, and that was just that. Like, it was, it was not even for, like, the purpose of, like, you know, science communication or anything, it just yeah. ended up becoming that. Yeah. And then when I saw like that people were into it, I was like, what is going on? This feels so surreal because to me, this is just like, just the product of us not doing our work in school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it became, you know, just, you know, a thing for fun. And then it, you know, people like really caught on to it. And I was surprised yeah. by that. But that's kind of the story. Isn't that, isn't that weird how, how sometimes the things that you have, that you have no intent behind end up being the things that kind of, so as, as a personal example, for uh, for whatever reason, so have you ever seen the skeletons at like Target or, yeah. or you know, around Halloween that are like really inaccurate, like they yes. have like the spider <laughs> skeletons and stuff. And <laughs> right. there was this time I was there with my, my wife and my son and I was looking at them and I just was kind of ranting about how inaccurate they were and why would an ear be placed here and how come it has this many ribs and birds don't have that many phalanges. And I was and the whole time my wife was recording me on Facebook Live. And then no like way. an hour later, I had like 150,000 views, <gasps> all these comments. Oh my gosh. Yeah, NPR Holy called crap. and wanted to interview what? me about, I'm like, what, what is happening right now? I was Man. completely thrown for a loop. That's like, amazing. I, this makes no sense, but okay. And <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even know if the, the interview with NPR ever even made it anywhere. Cause I, I was that confused because like, <laughs> like. So what do, what do you think is what would be important about having more accurate skeletons? I'm like, I, the, 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 what? <laughs> it was just really all over the place. But um, but it's still one of those things where like my you know my students are always like, Mr. Moker, you're famous because I'm like that. I had no intent behind that, but for some reason people got a kick out of it. I'm like, okay, the internet is whatever. powerful. Yeah, yeah, internet's a weird place. It's a good place, but a weird mm-hmm. place. It can yeah, be bad yes, place. indeed. <laughs> Uh, oh yes. So, uh, so, so with birds, birds. I, I know, I know that birds are not the only thing that you're interested in, um, much like me. But I'm, I'm, birds are a huge passion of mine. Um, in terms of going birding, what's what's your favorite bird experience that you've ever had? So that's a really hard question because there are a couple of like a, a series of different experiences that I've had that have been extremely like emotional in some way so one was like the first time I was even introduced to birding and saw my first blue jay just like on a powerpoint slide and freaked out because I was like that's a bird that lives here you know in my ornithology class as a junior in college I'd never seen a blue jay like when I thought of a blue jay I had pictured something more like a an eastern bluebird kind of bird like I'd never seen one you know what I mean and so when I said when people say blue jay I was like oh it's probably something like that um and when I found out that they were the bright blue, you know, white, black, yeah. all these different shades of blue. I like freak out, right? So they're my favorite bird, and that was a really incredible experience. But like the, and I and I and I don't like I don't want to reuse the story because I, I I say this a lot, but it really just is the most emotional story for me. 
pileated woodpeckers. Um, I was I'd never seen any woodpecker of any kind, but I yeah. imagined that woodpeckers were about the size of what I now know is the size of a downy woodpecker. Yeah, and yeah. So I was like, you know, that's probably a woodpecker size. And, you know, my sure. ornithology professor, Dr. Jason Corder, was kind of going through really common birds and he was started talking about the pileated woodpecker and he was like, This bird is about the size of a crow. And I was like, the size of a crow? Yeah. That's like, huge. What? You're exaggerating. <laughs> like surely you're exaggerating. Like surely this is, you know, this can't be what you're telling me it is. Yeah. And the more I learned about it, the more I just became obsessed. And mm-hmm. so from February 2013 to February, I'm sorry, February 2014 to February 2015, mm-hmm. I was on the lookout for this bird. I was listening to the radio station that was run by uh, a nearby Amish community that yeah. gave out bird location information. So people would oh. tell, call in to these, uh, to these individuals and say, hey, I saw this bird in this place. And then they would relay that information on this like AM frequency radio station that I would, you know, listen to every now and then. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to this radio station, looking, you know, looking out on the birding groups, watching for any sight of a pileated woodpecker. And it took a whole year. And then one day I got the call that there was a pileated woodpecker about an hour and a half away um, at this nature center. But it was blizzarding when I got that call. I'm like, hey, oh. I didn't have a car. I was like, somebody has to drive me in a blizzard to go find this, <laughs> find this bird, yeah. but who's going to do it? And thankfully, uh, one of my friend's moms, who's also a birder, she was like, I'm going if you're ready. We drove an hour and a half. It took longer than that. Yeah. But an hour and a half on a good day to find yeah. this pileated woodpecker. We marched out into the middle of the forest and it's like up to your knees snowing. And, but it's like that still like silent oh, snow, yeah. Yeah. like really big flakes. And we're just kind of standing there and we hear that like monkey laugh that they do, yeah. you know? Yeah, we call the them distance. Minnesota monkeys here. So. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, right? And I heard that and we froze and all of a sudden through the snow and like the pine trees, this brightly colored pileated woodpecker flies through and lands on a tree. And I, like I, I lied not, like I fell onto my knees and I was crying. And it was on Valentine's Day, February 14th, oh, wow. 2015, when I saw my first pileated woodpecker. And that to this day is like, the most riveting birding moment I've ever had, I have yeah. to say. And now, like, I, you know, I've lived in Tennessee and I've lived now in Georgia. And in both those places, pileated woodpeckers mm-hmm. are fairly easy to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, that has not made them any less special for me to see them. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that yeah. was a pursuit. Yeah, that's like, uh, that's like my, my, my wife has been on the lookout for a snowy owl for mm. years. And has never been, she's and she's only ever seen one owl. And then here I am. <laughs> See, she kind of hates me for this a little bit, but um, I, I used to be a park ranger for the U.S. Army Corps up in uh, Gold Lake, so a little okay. north of here in Minnesota. And when I would go out on the, to look through the campground at night, and this this is maybe my favorite bird experience. Uh, these two juvenile barred owls used to follow me around the campground. No way. <laughs> and I couldn't figure it out, but they would like they would land on a branch and hiss at me, and. <laughs> I was like, okay, and I would walk a little bit, and then they would fly up and land on a branch and hiss at me. And I'm like, okay, this is this is a little weird. This is really cool, but this is really weird. And uh, I ended up looking into it, what the sound was about because they were juvenile, and apparently that's their "Mom, I'm hungry" kind of sound. I'm like, oh, and you, you became mom. <laughs> I was wow. their mother. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, but gosh, interesting. But, you know, she's always. I feel really bad. Like maybe 30 minutes before we hopped on this call. I thought I saw a snowy owl maybe right off the road and, and we did a loop back and it was, it was another bird of prey. Um, okay. I was excited still. She was, sure. she punched me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand that. Yeah. I still have not seen my first snowy owl either. So I, yeah. now that I'm in the South, it'll be harder, I think, but, oh, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, I still am on the lookout one day. Yeah. yeah. Have you, have you always loved birds? No. 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 So like I, birds were like, I love the wildlife in general, but birds were certainly probably at the bottom of the list as far as coolness to me. Yeah. 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 And I was like, certainly, and, and definitely not like North American birds. Cause I just yeah. figured they were all like the most colorful bird was a Robin and yeah. that's the only bird I knew. And it was like, they're all little, they're all Brown and kind of the same. So like, not that Brown is beautiful, but like they're yeah. all the same. You know yeah. what I mean? So I yeah. was like, mm, birds. And so when I had to take ornithology, you know, the study uh-huh. of birds, I was not excited because it was like, you know, I knew that you'd have to learn like 150 birds by sight and 
you know, yeah. send me something birds by sound. I'm like, I don't even like birds, man. Like birds yeah. aren't even that great. I got in that class, man. They changed my whole life. So yeah. Yeah. I, I feel I'm feeling like we're a bit kindred spirits. And, <laughs> really? So I, I did not. I just didn't care. I just didn't really care mm-hmm. about birds. And and uh, I, I went into ornithology with the same exact same kind of mindset. And I got interested. And then I had a whole slew of stuff happen. I was I was being a bad student. I got really sick. I ended up and this is really embarrassing because like I'm really into birds now and people ask me ID questions all the time. Um, but I I failed ornithology the first time and then right. I had to retake it. Um, and then I got a 90 on both finals the last time. So, hey, hey. Uh, ornithology is a hard class. Like it's a hard yeah. class. Yeah. 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 You know. But then I was obsessed after mm. that point. Um, yeah. But so awesome. so <laughs> with with uh, sparrows. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious about your your research. I'm gonna butcher the name. It's the Mac MacGill MacGill Seaside. First off, just in general with sparrows, I was really shocked, <laughs> like in that class, learning it, how many types there were. And my professor yeah. at the time, he actually he used to call them. He said they're they're the little brown <laughs> of the the animal kingdom because there's <laughs> so many. They look so similar. And if yeah. Someone to send you a picture with no like habitat context. It's like I don't mm-hmm. know what that is. Yeah. Um, so yes, so many types. So people listening, like really look at sparrows. They're awesome. They're all over the place. Um, yeah. But the the McGillivray is is that how you say it? McGill McGillivray McGillivray seaside sparrow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so what what exactly are you looking at in, in studying them? Yeah. So uh, the McGillivray seaside sparrow is a subspecies of seaside sparrow, um, and this particular subspecies is found in North and South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. And so I am studying nest predation in their breeding habitat. But to give you a little context as to why, um, so they live in coastal salt marshes. Mm -hmm. And so sea level rise, which is happening, you know, as a result of climate change is an immediate kind of threat to their survival. Um, And so where they live, they live in a tidal environment. So the water level rises and falls twice a day and they nest, they build their nests out of and in the marsh grass. Um, and they kind of have to put it at a sweet spot. So they want, don't want to put it too low because mm-hmm. if they put it too low, they can get flooded by the high tide. But sea level rise makes high tides higher and higher. Um, and they oh. are behaviorally adapted, though, to respond to nest flooding. So if oh, they okay. nest at a certain height, they get flooded and they lose their offspring. As yeah. a result, they'll re-nest immediately and they'll build their nest higher the oh. next time. So it's like that's their response, which is good, you know. Um, but the problem with that is that when they lose a nest to flooding and then re-nest higher in the grass, uh-huh. the higher they are in the grass, the more visible they are to predators. So oh. sea level rise is creating essentially this catch-22 where it's like you are caught on both sides um, yeah. when it comes to where you place your nest. So I am looking at the nest predation side of this issue. Yeah. And so I'm trying to understand if there is a pattern to the way that predators are distributed in the, in the marsh. Uh-huh. And the pattern to where nests are most depredated. Um, and the reason why I'm kind of looking at this information is because as sea level rise kind of like engulfs the marsh and fragments their yeah. habitat and their habitat is more patchy and made of smaller, smaller patches. Um, DNR is like Department of Natural Resources in Georgia and other places where this species is found um, may have to use measures like predation control. So kind of excluding predators from the places where they are going to be most abundant. And if I can, you know, create a map and figure out if, if you can kind of predict relative nest predation threat, you can kind of focus your nest predation reduction initiatives yeah, in those areas. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what my research is aiming to do, to be able to map that out and be able to kind of relatively predict where predation will be highest for these birds yeah. um, for future management. That's, that's, that's really interesting. It's like the, uh, it's almost like the, uh, like a flying fish dilemma. Like you can fly out of the water if you stay above water long enough, you you avoid predators underwater. Mm-hmm. But if you get too high, too much lift, well now there's birds, friggin' birds, right. waiting for you. So it's just waiting like, ah, for you. Yeah. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Um, mm-hmm. Huh? So what what is it like? I mean, how how often are you out there in the field? What is it like to actually be in the field, um, working with these working with these birds? Yeah. So my field season, which coincides with their breeding season, is. Mm-hmm. 
uh, like end of April until end of July. That's okay. kind of the, the span of their breeding season. Yeah. Uh, also the hottest months of the year in oh, Georgia yeah. and everywhere That's else, of course. Um, but so uh, when I'm out there, I am essentially using a variety of different kinds of surveillance equipment. So video cameras, like, you know, regular, just like, you know, duck and donut security cameras, basically, <laughs> um, that I, you know, have waterproof and I have DVRs and all kinds of electrical yeah. equipment that don't like salt water. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all waterproofed and um, marsh proofed, but I'm placing video cameras on top of seaside sparrow nests to monitor them for nest predation and to know what kind of predators are depredating their nests. And I also have camera traps throughout the marsh that are not associated with nests, but just mm -hmm. seeing if predators are distributed predictably throughout the marsh. Um, and just as an aside, we have looked at, you know, predation rate for nests with cameras and nests without them. And then there's no effect of the camera on the nest when it comes ah. to predation, just okay. in case people yeah. ask sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of what I'm working with equipment wise, but every day, uh, I'm either managing equipment out in the marsh or I am looking for nests. And so um, the tough thing about looking for nests made of marsh grass in marsh grass is that oh, it's, yeah. it just looks like the grass, you know? And so I'm really depending on behavioral cues from the parents mm -hmm. to let me know that I'm near a nest. And then I'll start kind of combing through the surrounding area where I'm standing. Because um, as you approach a nest, the parents will start making a very distinct like chipping sound that's kind of oh, their okay. defensive sound yeah. call to ward you off and let others know that there's an intruder, but it, it, it does the opposite for me. It lets me know that there's a nest yeah. there. And so yeah. I start looking. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm doing. And the marsh is a salty place. It is right against the ocean. And so there are like huge chunks of salt on all of the marsh grass, um, yeah. it's super hot. Um, yeah. But it's so surreal and wonderful. It's like a wonderland out there. So many different kinds of, invertebrates birds oh yeah um, yeah i mean yeah, right. the ocean is right there so you can even see the fish so it's, yeah. it's very cool yeah that's what i miss about um i'm not originally from minnesota i'm originally from houston and, oh uh, that's what i miss about like the bayou ecosystem and stuff. Mm. that's actually where I, I i funny enough so i i was a, a wildlife student you know wildlife biology um and i took a semester to go down to texas to do some internships and take some classes and um I at Armin Bayou Nature Center, I kind of went with really an intent to do anything. I was just like, hey, what do you what do you have? I'll do whatever you want. And they were looking at my stuff. I'm like, well, do you want to try out education? And I was like, I mm -hmm. guess I've never really considered it. And oh, my God, I fell in love and it, it changed my life from there. But and then That's taking awesome. kids out in, in the bayou and everything, mm. it's always kind of rough <laughs> in terms of navigation. <laughs> I can't I can't imagine what like trying to trudge through a salty marsh <laughs> it's like looking for nest colored nest um, right. it's got to be kind of difficult <laughs> yeah yeah but it's rewarding it makes every yeah. nest fine feel like you hit gold yeah gosh so in in terms of uh the seaside sparrows i suppose i mean i i feel like this is always one of those tough bits it's a tough question because um every species that we talk to somebody about uh nine out of 10 times. Okay. Let's just say 10 out of 10 times. The biggest impact on that species is people in mm -hmm. some way. And it's usually climate change it is like yeah. the largest, biggest thing. And that's a many people, many problem type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't have one simple, easy fix. Um, so with, with seaside sparrows, is there, is there something that aside from changing behaviors in terms of reducing impact on the climate, um, that's that people might be able to do to to help the cause. Yeah. So um, this past when was it? This past fall, mm -hmm. uh, I, I never really thought about this very much until this incident. So this cargo boat boat carrying like two thousand cars tipped over right on the coast of Georgia, oh, right no. in between my two field sites, and spilled oh. so much oil. Right. So that was in like September or October, and that boat is still there. Still mm -hmm. there, still leaking oil. And it made me think about, you know, because I went out to my field sites to see, like, what's the damage? Um, and it oiled up a lot of the marsh. And I didn't see the invertebrates there that I usually see. Like, there's usually thousands and thousands of periwinkle snails, like, within, yeah. you know, just looking distance. And mm -hmm. I didn't see any when I went out there. And I was like, wow, like, this is going to have 
it, it can affect the birds directly, you know, by getting yeah. oil on a bird, but it also has, you know, an impact, an impact on the food chain starting at the bottom. Yeah. And, um, at the same time, I was kind of learning about uh, learning from some of my marine biologist friends where they did a little experiment where they poured like a dye, um, 200, approximately like a one or 200 miles inland from the ocean in like in the watershed there. And mm -hmm. within a couple of days, that dye was in the ocean. And it's like it was a huge reminder to me that very small decisions by a single person or yeah. a community or a family like whatever you put into the water where mm -hmm. you are is going to end up in the ocean and on the coast, um, in the marshes, even if you are not even close to a marsh. Um, yeah. But even more, I don't want to say more importantly, but in addition to that, it's also going to affect the water that you are accessing for you to live yeah. and for yeah. everything around you to live. And so water quality is a very, um, very important and often degraded part of our natural resources. And so one of the things I like to remind people to think about is to when, you know, when you are using, when you have the option rather to use chemicals that are not environmentally um, friendly or, mm -hmm. or that are toxic in any way to your ecosystem that you have to use as well, um, to think about not only the impact it's going to have on you and your family and your surrounding wildlife, um, but on, on ecosystems very, very far from you that you may have never seen and may never see. Yeah. Um, it has very far reaching impacts when you're dealing with water pollution. So I always encourage people to be very wise stewards of their local water because the local water becomes global water, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's, that's kind of what I, what I tell folks when they ask about that. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I always try to, I, I, I don't know. I, it always, to me in my head, I'm always thinking, you know, in terms of environment, anything, um, species or i mean even just individual decisions that we think are meaningless mm -hmm. nothing exists in isolation and everything you do has some level of trickle effect and mm -hmm. that might be really hard to comprehend and therefore hard to act on or change a habit on because it's just like what that's 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 a reach but like it it, it totally happens it's very yeah. real and it's just a hard mental problem i think for, mm -hmm. for a lot of people but um, nothing like just constant reminders <laughs> and communication yeah. of the info, hopefully will, will make a change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And always like relating it back to the well-being of themselves, you know, yeah. since we are yeah. necessarily yeah. connected to our, our surroundings. Yeah. Well, one, one of the hardest pieces I think in, um, that, I, that I'm always trying to keep in mind is, you know, so, sometimes, um, you know, people are doing the best that they can. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and sometimes it, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you just go into a grocery store, sometimes, you know, the, the cleaner things and stuff are, are more expensive, the greener, mm -hmm. greener costs more green. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, okay. Um, if, I would love to do something, but I'm, I'm being pushed out of being able to do something. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's highly unfortunate, but yes, yes. And I think that's, it's, and that's one of the hardest things in conservation and one of the hardest things to get people to think about who have the money to be able yeah. to be green, you know, yep. and this trend, this, this goes so deeply in conservation, not just with, you know, yeah. stewardship of our local environment, but just like how we think about and, and advocate for conservation programs around the world. Mm -hmm. It's like people don't think about the people who have been pushed to the margins of society socioeconomically, yeah. Yeah. you know, because of their ethnicity or whatever, and therefore yep. cannot participate in these green uh, practices, um, but mm -hmm. we do need to be holding accountable the people who are the the big polluters, the ones who are subsidizing certain yeah. kinds of products. You know, like the whole the system, as opposed to the the small <laughs> operators yeah. who already who've been marginalized for centuries. You know, it's like yeah. getting people to think about the social element of this entire thing is is so crucial. Yeah, yeah. you bring up yeah. a very good point. Yeah, sorry, Nancy on Sixth Avenue, it's your fault. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> you know, it's like what? Um, um, it actually brings up something that I mean, this is sort of a side tangent, but it's an important one, I, I suppose. I, I saw something on your Twitter feed recently that um, I just thought was a really good point about, um, un, you know, the the idea of like untouched nature mm -hmm. and and how so often, um, you know, indigenous peoples or 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 you know are, their their practices are kind of said, oh no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a practice that's important to your culture, and you've been doing it for thousands of years. But because we decided to exploit and use mm -hmm. and deplete, now you can't do it anymore. And, right. And 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 just how kind of warped 
and sad mm-hmm. <laughs> of a concept that that really is. Um, and I, I think a lot of people, you know, they, yeah, they probably have this idea of like, oh, untouched nature. And it's like, well, okay, what does that even mean? And what do you mean? Who, who has touched it? Um, right. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's the bigger question. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's again, it like comes back to the, the, human dimension of conservation and it's like you i even i like a person part of a marginalized community my family actively suffers from the issues of environmental racism like right did not even recognize like i was kind of indoctrinated with the idea that indigenous people are the enemy you know the poachers Mm -hmm. they're the the ones that are killing the poor gorillas and the the cute rhino and it's like what like i've decided to you know the people who have been pouring this into me have decided to place priority on certain kinds of creatures, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The cute ones, the fuzzy ones, whatever, uh, the charismatic ones, and then demonize whole groups of people for an yeah. emergency that they, they created. created. Not, you know what I mean? And it's like, <laughs> right. And it, it took me until I was an adult to even realize that system was happening and that I thought that way. And I was strongly convicted and I, I try to share the kind of information and way of thinking that I have been able to digest and incorporate into my own life with other people yeah. because that is very crucial and central to our ability to to make any sort of uh large enough movement in the realm of sustainability and conservation into yeah. the future because you cannot work against groups of people period right. like that that's not right. going to work and especially yeah. not demonizing the victim you know that's yeah so a lot has to be considered yeah 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 it's something that we've been i i think i mean just so so, so like the whole reason that i um started this like the, the wildlife and stuff so I, I was i was a park ranger and i was a naturalist and i did my whole wildlife thing and i've worked in wolf conservation and i'm a high school teacher but i i, I there at least in my local community there's very little in terms of environmental education there's mm. basically nothing um and then i was thinking back to some of my more personal experiences so i, I worked with this nonprofit that was was kind of a job training program for um kids who who were i guess labeled as at risk or mm-hmm. at risk um which is a term that i don't know but you yeah know, at risk. Yeah. and um and, and and what we did was so we built this bridge outside and so it was kids who had no experience really being outside or anything like that and and something that i noticed was that most of them were youth of color and uh i i, I think of this one all the time who who a squirrel came about five feet from him and he had no idea how to react in the presence of a squirrel and it was <laughs> and i was like oh gosh okay and and um you know seeing that and then realizing mm-hmm. okay so there's there's a disconnect here mm-hmm. a, a bit and and trying to look at like what were the reasons for that mm-hmm. and um and you know even with my my high school students i teach in a i teach in, a, in an alternative high school um my students are ones that have been categorized as, you know, having emotional behavioral disorders or things mm. of that nature. Um, and, and again, I have mostly students of color and, um, what I see though is a lot of interest. Like I have, I have a lot of students who, um, all like they want to watch BBC things all the time. They, mm. they are really into wildlife and, and nature and, um, want careers there but they're not really sure how to do it they don't really know if it's for them or accessible if they would be welcomed into it Mm -hmm. um and so it was kind of a motivating thing of like okay well maybe if i can do something where i can like start like a start small and i'll do a podcast and it's you know something that's a little bit more accessible in terms of getting information out there and uh lead community hikes and things like that and then maybe someday um do more to get the youth into the community involved in participating in those hikes, maybe even leading the hikes. And mm, um, yeah, and I've really That's been awesome. wanting to do things to like connect with the local university to see if there's some way to like filter people into the biology programs and things mm, like that. Um, yeah. But I'm not really sure how. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's a it's a it's a long process of trying to navigate. But um, mm-hmm. I don't really remember where I was awesome. going with that. But. <laughs> Um, no that's that's incredible and i like it reminds me so like i my university that i went to um malone university in ohio they actually were looking for a way to connect like like connect make a make a not a pipeline but like a connection between themselves and local high schools um public high schools in their area regarding wildlife and natural sciences careers Mm -hmm. 
um, to kind of get kids who were not typically being reflected, like demographics that weren't being reflected in the program into that program. And they asked me to, to direct it and apply for this like housing and urban development grant. And so I ended up getting that grant and they provided money for educational opportunities and, and yeah. experiences that I was able to design and, and offer that was in con uh, connection with my school so that I had the school's resources as well. And so we would kind of intertwine, you know, here's exposure to a variety of different careers as well as, you know, here's what college is like. And, you know, you might, you know, if you're interested in going to this college, like, you yeah. know, this is how you do it. So we, we kind of had a little partnership there and that ended up being pretty fruitful. So I, like, I would, that's such an exciting and like, I've seen that be an effective like yeah, partnership yeah. to have with universities. So I, yeah. I'm really, I'm rooting for you here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so what, what would you say uh, to, uh, when, so like when people, when people ask me about, uh, you know, how, how do they get involved in a career like that? For myself, I never really saw it as an opportunity. Um, it was something I sort of fell into and found once I was in college. And then I realized, oh, well, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, yeah. that, that's actually pretty neat. Uh, what would you say to, to kids who want to be like you? Like how, how, what would you tell them to do? So the thing that I'm supposed to say is, <laughs> you know, uh, like volunteer, like if you say you, you have heard of a certain kind of job, right. And yeah. you have that, that job exists somewhere near you where you live. Mm -hmm. Um, reach out, like go there, reach out to someone who works there and say, Hey, like, is there any opportunity for me to volunteer? Right. Yeah. And like, that's Gosh, kind that's of the so way hard. the system has worked. Right. That's, that's yeah. kind of the way the system has worked for a while. Right. Yeah. But the problem is that you don't make money. So if right. you are someone who needs to have a job, yeah. um, then you can't do that. And that's yeah. one of the biggest barriers and the things that upsets me. Like I was able to get into this career because the zoo that I uh, interned at for three years was down yeah. the street from my house and my mom um, I lived in a, like a single parent household and like mm -hmm. she definitely couldn't afford for me not to be working but like she let me do it yeah. and not everyone can do that you know no. um, but there are thankfully so if you are someone who can volunteer and you you have the capacity like financially to be able to offer free labor that yeah. is kind of that's a really good way to get in so if you know of a place or of a person that does what you want to do reach out and ask if there are ways to volunteer so if it's at a zoo zoos have internships and the, you, you have to do internships if you want to get a job yeah. um, so intern at your local zoo um, look for internships if you need to make money like if volunteering is not an option there is an organization called the greening youth foundation which okay pays for students who are i think um i want to say high school and college aged to do internships that usually aren't paid but they'll pay them they'll pay those oh. to do the internship um, oh. as well as provide professional development funds for them to go to conferences and network yeah. it's the greening youth foundation um it's the best one that i know of that, that does that mm -hmm. kind of thing so i would encourage you to to check them out if you if you want to be able to try to make money and get experience yeah. at the same time. But I would definitely reach out to whatever the most local version of what you want to do and, and see what it's like. Because one of the biggest mistakes people can make is like look at a career from the outside and be like, oh, that is what I want to do. Yeah. And go to college for it without ever actually getting experience or getting, getting their feet wet in the career and then find yeah. out like, I hate this. I don't yeah. want this. You know what I yeah. mean? Like a lot of careers can look different from the outside. So even if yeah. it's just like a day of shadowing, just yeah. see if you can go see what it looks like before you commit any further and then kind of go from there. Yeah. Well, that, that brings up, okay, a lot of good points really. But like one of the, one of the things that um, I always try to get across to people is like, so biology, one thing, it's, it can be an incredibly dirty thing and it might involve a lot of poop. It just depends. Yeah. Like it, there's usually a substantial amount of unexpected poop um, from animals, <laughs> things like that. It's like, oh, okay. Didn't realize I'd have to deal with that. The yeah. other piece is math. Um, mm -hmm. Tremendous amount of math. And like, mm -hmm. I, I feel like, so the reason I included the weird acronym in my notes here that said meets is because my wife mm -hmm. has been on this kick lately. Uh, we're both teachers and she's been on this oh, kick nice. where she's like, you know, I love the idea of STEM and STEAM. But like maybe it should be meets because I feel like people frequently are like, oh, look how cool science is, explosions. But then they like don't mention the math part. And then mm. people get into school. And they're like, oh, wait, math. I should have taken yeah. more math in high school, maybe. Oh, mm. and then they quit or, or something. And it's just like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like the intellectual honesty of like what the job really entails and what to mm -hmm. expect. And 
Um, yeah. But yeah, the 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 this the money piece and like the, I mean, I can't tell you how many things I had to turn down because they weren't you know weren't paid, and I was mm-hmm. in a position where I just I couldn't. I I had a lot of really cool opportunities, but I was just like I I can't I can't yeah. I can't do that. I can't go without pay. Mm-hmm. And it seems like in terms of uh, science careers, but even just the outdoors and like yes. going to parks and like and and it's sort of a twofold thing it's like there's massive socioeconomic barriers there yes um that just are it almost feels designed in it in mm-hmm. yes <laughs> it's definitely a systemic thing where it's like designed to keep different groups out and then yeah. i i don't know how to get past that yeah um, yeah it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of like what i the way that i've seen this happen and like you know even in like the the school side, like graduate school, like students who are yeah. not getting paid enough to survive in grad school, like as teaching assistants or grad or research assistants, you know, like they need more money, like they cannot pay their rent. So we're going to go on strike until you pay us enough to survive. You know, like a lot of, a lot of change has happened from the inside out. And so what I always say is that like, if you're someone who already is in the, the organization or career field, like start advocating for that, start advocating for either people to pay their interns, like yeah. fundraise for that, like, like, adjust your vision and mission for your organization so that that is included. Don't just settle for, you know, oh, we don't have funding for that. Like restructure yeah. the way you think about this organization and create funding for that. Like yeah. the same yeah. way that you've decided that this is an important tenant or this is an important goal and you've created funds for that. Like this has yeah. to be, otherwise you're going to maintain this homogenous environment, which is going to limit the success of the organization. You know what yeah. I mean? In addition yeah. to keep people out. So it's, yeah. it, I think it needs to start from the people who are in there already. Yeah. Well, and there, there's something to be said. I'd like that you use the word homogenous because it's like in biology, we always have all these examples of like why homogeny is not a good thing and it's not mm-hmm. sustainable. Um, but then when it comes to like all, our, our own behavior as people, we're like, ah, nah, homogeny is fine. Right, <laughs> it's like, right, oh, right. No, there's a reason like diversity works in, yes. in, in multiple perspectives and people of different mm-hmm. backgrounds and racial backgrounds. Like you can't just have one group doing everything. It's just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's dangerous. And it's like, you can't solve problems as efficiently and you like, you can't progress as, as cleanly or as quickly it's diversity is is crucial yeah what do you think in terms of like uh uh, like youth of youth of color in particular like getting reaching youth of color i suppose one on one hand and 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 um getting them involved in either science or just the outdoors i mean one or the other Um, how how do you navigate that how do you do that especially with some of these barriers that exist like how do you how do you get past those barriers um, so I think first and foremost, I think the most important element of, of what I'm doing is that I am a black person, I'm yeah. a black woman yeah. going to, you know, black students or other students of color. And I'm like, yep. Hey, I'm doing this. So like, you can trust me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can trust that I understand your perspective. Um, yeah. I also, I also physically declare that I, I share the perspective and I ask <laughs> them about theirs. I ask them what yeah. they think about, you know, various elements of being outdoors, you know, nature, things like that. And I, and I, create the common ground. I, I create so much common ground um, so mm-hmm. that they are willing to follow my lead. And I don't, I think that, that that's the case for anyone. Like it's really, I find that it's really easy for, for white people to, and I, this happens all the time online, you know, people yeah. will get mad at me or other black people or other people of color who talk about the fact that they, that like there being black people in this field is important for other black people. Yeah. And the yeah. reason why these people don't understand that is because they have been surrounded by people like themselves their whole life. So they have no concept of why it's important to see yeah. people like you. Right. Like imagine a world like to any of those people, I would say, imagine a world where everyone around you is black. Mm-hmm. Like, would you walk into a, a space if you were looking for a restaurant, if you were looking for a venue for, for something or, to, you know, if you mm-hmm. were looking at a space and it was all black people, would you walk in? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right, and it's right. like if people think about them being the only whatever they are in a space, if, because they've probably never felt that before, like that's yeah. the first step to understanding like the kinds of issues that come from being the only one. And so yeah. um, I, it's not that I think that, you know, black kids need some sort of special advertising, you know, some sort of special sure. language spoken to them when it comes yeah. to talking about the outdoors or anything, but they need to see that they're welcome because mm-hmm. the outdoors are historically a hostile place for black people. So mm-hmm. and I'm not going to talk about, you know, I can't speak for every, <laughs> 
ethnic minority in the, in the U.S., but I can speak for Black people, and it's like the outdoors is not a safe place, and so our yeah. parents tell us, "Don't go out there." You yeah. know what I mean? Don't go yeah. with those white people out there. You don't know what they're going to yeah. do to you out there. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's because they themselves have had experience out there. Yeah. You know? and oh, it's I, like, I've had students like who will who, like tell me like, "Oh, I really love watching this stuff," and I'm like, "Oh, what, like come on this," and they're like, "No, no, no, no." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, like oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It doesn't yeah, yeah, feel yeah. safe, at least, rather, you know. And yeah. It's, um. And so it's like, you have to, like, so if you're not a black person or if you're not a person yeah. of color, you have to acknowledge that. So if yeah. you are someone who's trying to like reach out to people of color or like African-American people who have a very specific history in this country with the outdoors and with white people in the yep. outdoors, yep. Um, you need to not, when they, when, when people react av- aversively to the thought of going outside, don't respond with like, why? Like, yeah. how come? Or, you know, why just like, that not a priority believe for them. You? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when they say they're uncomfortable, believe them, ask them why, you know, and don't, you know, I'm not saying to assume why someone feels uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but don't act bewildered by the fact that people don't want to go outside and go out in, in nature, you know, alone or with you, or, you know what I mean? If you're yeah. not another person of color. Um, and so recognize the kind of environment that the outdoors has been for certain groups of people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think you brought up, I mean, you as, as, I mean, everything, you have a lot of good points, but like one, one thing in particular, um, it's like, it's like the role model. I mean, when you're a little kid and you're watching TV or a movie and you're like, ah, I can be that person because it's someone who looks like you. And, and so if you don't see that, Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe you're not going to consider that as a career path, or maybe it might not be a priority, or, or whatever, because you don't see you, and like mm-hmm. people want to see themselves. Uh, that's right. that's just human nature. I, I I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yes. Um, yeah. I think another component too is like, you know, thinking that thinking that um, I'm thinking of one student in particular because of legal reasons. I can't like say his name <laughs> or yeah. anything like that, obviously, but. Um, who very much wants to be a zoologist, mm. but they don't think that they can be because they don't fit the look. Mm-hmm. And I'm always saying like, well, just be you. Like, why do you have to, you don't need like, you don't need the big goofy hat. <laughs> or, right. Or yeah. like the weird vest with a whole bunch of pockets. Like you are a really <laughs> stylish kid, bring that style there, be your authentic yep. self. And like, you could be killing it. Uh, yeah. and, and there's no reason, you know, you don't have to like, oh, uh, let me just dress like this old white dude with the <laughs> yeah you, you don't yeah. have to do that yeah. um yeah. yeah yeah and that is precisely actually why when i go on hikes i don't wear hikey clothes or like like i have biologist clothes now that like people have given to me or told me i should get or whatever but i don't wear that when i'm going out with people like me like what what's the, what's the point i don't wear this in real life so like i'm gonna wear my jeans and my earrings and how, whatever I, other clothes i want to wear out here and that's yeah. fine like yeah. Like, do you? Yeah. 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 You know, I think that's one of the reasons that, um, well, one that I like you so much and that like, <laughs> I think you do so well on you know, social media and things is because you're just so genuine. Um, I feel Thank like, you know, you. just in interacting with your posts and stuff, it's like, oh, like, this is a real person. Um, mm-hmm. This is a real person and, and they're being themselves and they're not like, you know, they're not like a lot of other people that sure. will name on social media and things and it's just like okay clearly this is like you know a persona that they are trying to gain followers or make money or whatever and yeah i think and then i think that's what makes you really good at psycom and, and communicating information and stuff but i do i do Thank also you. wonder like <laughs> as as you <laughs> what what do you think makes really good science communication um, I think what, what the one thing that I found is that like, don't try to sound like you're the intellectually superior person in the room. Like there's yeah. no point to doing that. Like trying to make other people feel less smart than you. No yeah. point to doing that. And in fact, that completely walls people off from hearing anything you have to say. So whether it's like in person education or you're online talking to somebody, especially online, because tone is hard to communicate online. Um, do not try to make yourself sound as though you are the superior human being um but and and along with that like be excited like don't don't i see i see people sometimes in an effort to look like the expert yeah and people will know you're the expert because you've got a lot of information to share that's all you know what i mean yeah but like in an effort to seem like the most you know well-traveled well-experienced person they don't they're not excited about anything anymore it's like oh yeah this is a blah 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 or oh yeah like that's just a blah 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 and it's like uh you just killed the mm-hmm. vibe first of all like you're not even excited <laughs> about the thing that yeah. you studied or you're not excited about this thing you just saw outside yeah well, that makes and sense if everyone around you just got excited you just killed the vibe and and now maybe they're not excited anymore or now they they feel 
like it makes them look dumb or inexperienced to be excited. And so yeah. the excitement you had when you first learned about it, keep that same energy every time you are communicating that to someone yeah. else. And if someone comes to you and it's their first time, don't try to dampen their excitement with your years of experience. Like be there in that moment with them and match their energy. Yeah. Like the, those kind of are the, the two bigger, the two biggest elements to just communicating inf any information about literally anything yeah. to another person. Yeah. You know, I think <laughs> I'm sort of guilty of not, not all of that, but like, I feel like in person, I'm really good about the excitement piece and I want to like leading hikes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But then I, I've got, you know, this, uh, I have, I have had a hard time in the social media realm of like, you know, just being me and like feeling like it's okay to be excited and stuff. Cause I, you know, for a while I was like, Oh, it needs to be like professional and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And I'm like, well, okay, but that's not me. I'm kind of goofy and I get really overly excited about everything and oh, yeah. I need to figure out how to show that. And I, I've had a hard time. I don't know if it's a confidence thing or what, and I don't know why I'm getting all deep here. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, ah, I need to, I need to work on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's enriching. It's like when you can just like kind of be able to express and feel like you have adequately expressed how you feel like it's, it's freeing. Yeah. Highly yeah. recommend. Yeah. What do you think? Um, so on, on sort of the con wall, I guess you kind of answered that in terms of, uh, I mean, what do you think, what do you think can be potentially damaging? Like with, you know, people who are aspiring science communicators who are, who are really trying to get out there and, and help share information. So what is something that they can do that's really damaging? To the cause? Yeah, I, I think that when it comes to like one of the, the places where damage can happen most easily is when someone is wrong. So mm -hmm. when someone is wrong, like on the internet or in person, like somebody has some really like foul opinion about snakes or someone that, that's yeah. like, that's based on a wrong, an incorrect assumption or incorrect yeah. information or somebody, you know, somebody has an opinion that upsets you or that, that like, maybe genuinely upsetting and disturbing based on incorrect information. The, the, the kind of visceral reaction to have is to correct them with anger and correct mm -hmm. them kind of meanly because you kind of feel like they deserve it. And, I, and I, I'm not gonna say everyone's guilty, but I certainly am. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. someone who is very emotionally expressive and very confrontational. And so I feel always compelled to like, let someone know when they're wrong. Yeah. But it's like, if I'm <laughs> actually trying to contribute to their edification to to, uh -huh. to changing their behavior and the way they think if yeah. i'm coming at them with this overly like clearly negative attitude if i'm coming at them with hostility they are not going to receive anything i'm saying and this will have been a pointless interaction and have had no net benefit at all in fact just yeah. done damage and so i think that an exercise a kind of a discipline that science communicators and communicators of any kind of important information um, need to to kind of train themselves to do is to not respond. And even if that person is angry, even if that person yeah. comes to you with the bad energy first, to not match that energy <laughs> yeah. and to and to respond with kindness all the time. And it's like yeah. if some if someone is being you know like violating you or violating someone else or disrespecting someone else, that's a different thing. And I and I think there are ways to handle that. But when it comes to just the transmission of information, I think you have to practice doing it with kindness, no matter what you are perceiving from, mm -hmm. you know, the position that person has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and hopefully by doing so, you're not like burning some kind of connective bridge that might have might have brought somebody into the fold. Right. And, and then now you're like, ah, no, you don't belong here. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Your opinions aren't valid. You're mm -hmm. dumb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in, in science, in the world of science, because you seem, you seem like you uh, are exposed to a lot of different things and stuff. Um, what, what is something that you are seeing right now that, that has you excited? Uh, the most you know exciting thing for me right now. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was like, I know that could be like a lot of things. But, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Recently, the thing that's been really exciting me has been a lot of the break, breakthroughs in breeding endangered species that have been happening in zoos. So oh. there are a lot of species, like a lot of species are endangered, obviously, and a lot are imperiled in some way. But there are like specific species that are very difficult to breed. And the thing that's going to kind of save species from extinction are places that are kind of breeding them and, and yeah. housing them in human care. It's kind of like an ark, you know what I mean? A, a good yeah. kind of analogy is like, you know, think of Noah's Ark, if you're familiar with the story, and it's like everything got wiped out, but there was kind of a remnant population of every, you know, remnant or set of individuals of every species, and so things were repopulated. If you take that idea, it's kind of what zoos are now. So it's like 
if this species is in human care, it's being like at an accredited zoo or aquarium, mm -hmm. of course. Um, yeah. That species genetics is being managed. Every like every single breeding pair, every single offspring that's happening is very strategic, and it is based on you know how do they maximize genetic diversity and population health for this species. So yeah. that species cannot go extinct as long as it exists in human care. Um, yeah. So there are certain kinds of animals though that are very difficult to breed because they have very secretive lifestyles or hard to understand natural histories and scientists mm -hmm. either don't know what they need to breed, you know, or they're, the, the, the setting of human care can be difficult for breeding certain kinds of animals like cats. So certain yeah. big cats, certain leopards, so clotted leopards, for example, have a very kind of like complex social system and you can't have males and females together outside of breeding season or also fight. So there's all yeah. these things you have to take into account that can complicate breeding them in human care. They now they have been breeding them, but it it's very slow process and it's like it's you know, we want to speed it up to be able to get their population to a healthy level in human care. And mm -hmm. they recently did the first ever um <clears throat> artificial insemination from frozen sperm from a, a clotted leopard across the world in Thailand. Oh, had wow. it shipped over artificially inseminated a clotted leopard in the US and she That's had incredible. she had a baby. And so it's like that was these kind of breakthroughs that are happening in the breeding of imperiled species excite yeah. me so much because it's hope that, you know, all of the issues that this species are facing in the wild, we at least know that we can maintain their existence in hum in human care if this really goes south. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. you know, once we are able to get their 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 natural habitats to a place where they can sustain a healthy population of individuals they can be reintroduced and reintroductions mm -hmm. happen in those cases. And so um, those kind of breeding breakthroughs are the, my, my favorite uh, kind yeah. of new situations in science right now. Yeah. Oh, those are always like, just like such like relieving mm -hmm. <laughs> moments because yes. you know, really conservation and, and biology and all, like it's just, it's like such an emergency career mm -hmm. field, yeah. and, like, at least now, like mm -hmm. if it wasn't before, especially now it's like, Oh gosh, all of this is incredibly urgent. And, we yeah. need all be working together across species. And um, so when news comes out like that, it's just like, oh, there's a chance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, indeed. Uh, 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 you had already, you had already said, uh, kind of switching up a little bit, but you had already said what your favorite bird is. Um, what mm -hmm. is your favorite non-bird animal? Oh. Or maybe that you've worked with or just like in general. Yeah. 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 So um, binturongs are, I would say, probably my favorite animal to have worked with. They're... Mm -hmm. Um, in a group called the Viverids, which is a very, not very well-known group across, you know, the world, really. They're from Asia. Viverids live in Asia and Africa. This particular yeah. kind of animal lives um, uh, in Southeast Asia, and they look like a combination between a monkey, a bear, and a cat. Very cool animals. Mm -hmm. um, definitely encourage you to Google them. And they smell like popcorn. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was really excited because I asked you that. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's true. I didn't know yeah. if they were or not. Why, yeah, why, yeah, yeah. Why do they smell like popcorn? It's their urine. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, so it kind of ruins okay. popcorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shoot. It's kind of like <laughs> beavers. You know, I, I, I do beaver programs and stuff. I'm like pass around a, a little jar of this, the scent gland and people are like, oh, that actually kind of smells good. I'm like, yeah, that's a, it's an anal gland. Wow. Back then. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, oh, okay. Oh, man. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> seen that that'd be cool yeah it's pretty interesting it smells like uh like a cross between like vanilla and and gasoline and maybe like a little bit of cinnamon it's it's yeah. got like the burn of gasoline but like the kind of vanilla -y scent and and uh people usda still allows a certain percentage of artificial vanilla to be made from that gland so sometimes when you're eating like artificial vanilla or if it says naturally flavored like vanilla Technically speaking, that natural flavor might be because it comes naturally from a beaver. So what? Yeah, I've never. Whole, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Listen, you know, now you'll eat that that vanilla ice cream and be like, oh man, the last time I eat <laughs> vanilla will be the last time I eat vanilla. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, uh, we so uh, one one other question. This was one that a listener had asked. Um, we and we actually just recently started a book club. We're trying to get more books out there and uh, uh get people involved in, in that route and um the thing is about a lot of like typical 
nature books you know you've got like john muir and like thoreau or like they appeal to a certain subset of people but they're also not the most appealing things in the world and they're kind of historically problematic and yes. yes it's like oh yeah um yeah uh, uh do you have any any um, literature recommendations around like science or or mm-hmm. nature um especially for like high school age kids and stuff who might be interested yeah I just finished uh, Ken Kaufman's most recent book, uh, and it's incredible. It's called, I have it next to me, actually. It's called um, A Season on the Wind Inside the World of Spring Migration. So this is specifically about birds. Yeah. And it's not like a textbook. You know, it's not, you know, this is migration, and this is what yeah. happened. It's, yeah. it's a story about the emotional experience of spring migration and how, you know, witnessing it when you pay attention just changes your life man and it, this book made me cry it made me laugh and then one of the reasons why i love ken kaufman so much is because he understands the, the importance of diversity and he is he 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 does not tolerate the lack thereof in his spaces yeah. and he, he addresses that in this book as well um and so i just the book is phenomenal i'm actually writing a little blog post yeah. about it now i highly recommend it yeah we'll have to we'll maybe we'll maybe look at that one as a uh as a uh, book club book because yeah. I actually really want to read it now. So yeah. Um, and then the other, the other book, so this is not a natural sciences book, but superior is a book by Angela Saini and it talks about some really important elements. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if people who are in high school now, if they would connect with this or not, but it talks about basically how race has been structured and, and, you know, quote yeah. unquote race science has created the, the social injustices that we see right now happening yeah. still. And yeah. it's totally understandable by a high school age reader. Um, but it's it's something that people should be reading because a lot of this kind of race science, like, yeah. you know, right. <laughs> and and, and the, the ethic that comes along with that has been resurfacing recently. Yep. And it's it's a timely book. And I would recommend if you're listening, if you're an adult, like definitely read it. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're mm-hmm. like looking to offer it to kids, like, you know, look at the read the, you know, the summary and see see what you think. Yeah. definitely recommend on social media uh uh sort of a, a last main question i guess um uh do you have any um any accounts that you think that people should follow anyone listening right now if they want to um kind of get the best of the best or see some really interesting people or really interesting work you know who who would you recommend mm-hmm. um so a few accounts that that i love just watching mm-hmm. um so one Corey Evans is a fish biologist, um, a, black, a black man who's a fish biologist, and he yeah. is from the same neighborhood as me. His Twitter, uh, his Twitter name is Sternarkella, which is not, <laughs> not easy to uh, imagine how it's spelled, but it's S T E R N A R C H E L L A. Sternarkella. It's the name of a fish group. Um, he is a really great one. Uh, Naya Butler Craig, she is in kind of like space science and mm-hmm. like astrophysics. Very dynamic black woman, wonderful, and she's just so pleasant. So she she just like will share information. And she's so far out of my field. I learned so much from her. It's like everything she says is new to me, and I love that. Yeah. Um, her uh, her at is Astro Naya, and it's spelled A S T R O N A I A. Um, and then finally, the last one that I'll kind of boost here is Sarah McAnulty. She um, started a nonprofit called Skype a Scientist, which is this. Yes. Yeah. So like it, so it basically cool. connects scientists from literally anywhere in the world with classrooms in the U.S. and in mm-hmm. any number of classrooms and people, students can just ask scientists questions. And it's really awesome. And she is a squid biologist specifically. And she obviously always shares really cool squid yeah. and cephalopod information. Very awesome. And her Twitter handle is Sarah McAttack. So Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, M-A-C-K, attack. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I, I actually follow all three of those. So really? Cool. Well, yeah. 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 Perfect <laughs> then. <laughs> well, we'll be sure to, like, at, at the in the episode notes, wherever this ends up, which is basically anywhere that you get a podcast. Um, I always have to say it like that wherever you get your podcast. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll put, we'll put the, the Twitter handles and things like that in there too. So if someone gets tripped up on the spelling or they're driving or something, sure. uh, they'll be there. So, <laughs> awesome. um, okay. Um, I, I, that's kind of all the questions that I had for the most part. I feel like I jumped around and stuff like that, but that, oh, that happens. Great. 
Um, <laughs> is there anything that you want people to know or any any like parting notes that you would like to leave people with? Um, I always encourage people, you know, when we're in the thick of just life, uh, every time we go outside, it's very easy to use our space outside, whether it's like walking from the house to the car, to the car, to the office or whatever. Like we use that to like, we fill that time. We fill that time with checking something on our phone or, or thinking yeah. about planning for the next thing. But I, I always encourage people to optimize that time because that's, that's a gift, those moments and to spend those commute times when you're outside, just in transit to, to take 30 seconds and look at a living thing. Um, not a plant. Plants are cool. You can look at a plant. That's fine. But like, look at like a, a moving, <laughs> living thing and yeah. just, just look at it exist. Watch it move through its world, you know, and that yeah. not just gets you to pay attention to the world around you and kind of think about and ask questions about this animal or consider something other than yourself, but it's just like relaxing, like brings a weight off your chest just to be present and focusing on something for that long. And then obviously, you know, the more you connect with the world around you, the more likely you are to be conscious of the ways you impact it in your everyday life. So I just encourage you for your own personal health and for the health of the world, just look closely. And that is just so well put. Uh, much like pretty much everything that Karina has to say, uh, very, very well put, well spoken. Um, now, if if things change, which I don't necessarily foresee them changing a whole lot, but our first hike back, because we canceled hikes for the next two months, um, our first hike back is a hike called Tiny Nature. It's sort of this thing that I do on the side um, during the summer where I pick like a, a five by five patch of something, grass, bushes, whatever, and then uh, kind of comb through them and just see what all I can see. And it's sort of like the longer you look, the more is revealed to you. And um, I get a kick out of it. And so I'm leading a hike where we're doing a little bit of little little bit of that. Um, heh, little. And uh, that's that's supposed to be for May. Now, will that change? Possibly. Probably. But um, for now, that's tentative. And we'll just uh, leave it be tentative for now. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I hope that you are giving her a follow as well as the other people that she recommended because if you aren't, what are you even doing right now? So give them a follow. It's a, a lot of entertainment, especially in these um, times where we're having to do a lot of self-entertaining and, and looking for entertainment. Um, I mean, you could always watch The Office again, but why not give these people a follow and learn something? We're also not going to do a new animal sound of the week this week. Yeah. Yeah. In part because last week that was the uh, episode that was specially hosted by, um, well, my mom and my wife. Uh, and, and their animal sound, we'll give it to you in case you didn't make the guess already because it was fairly obvious, was uh, Wolf. And what you don't know is that I had to spend maybe 10 minutes listening through their original audio and cutting out all the talks about let's just sing hungry like a wolf by duran duran so um that that i i fortunately saved you from plus it would have given the answer away so i mean whatever um but we're not going to do a new one this week um and, and here's here's why um, we're gonna take a very 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 short break i'm talking like a week We'll probably repost some old episodes, but maybe a week or two. Um, and the reason being is because, like I said, uh, my wife and I are both distance learning. Well, not distance learning. We are we are running distance learning. Our high schoolers are learning distantly. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of time, and it's with the kids at home. And so things are kind of scattered. And uh, uh, in addition, Richard, who is not here today, um, he is about to be making a move. Um, actually up to Minnesota from Houston. So um, while he gets all of that figured out and while we get our situation figured out, um, I just want to take something off the table to worry about. Um, something that we don't have to focus a whole ton on. And uh, we'll be back in just a couple of weeks. We have a lot of great upcoming episodes. There is an episode about orangutans that ends up being more about conservation ethic. It's wonderful. Um, there is an episode about snow leopards, the extinction of dinosaurs. We're working on our first ever uh, collaborative episode with another podcast. 
Uh, lots of lots of great stuff coming your way. So be on the lookout. Thanks again to our patrons, Megan Gariani, Andrea Lloyd, Matt Capella, Chris Trinkle, and Bridget Fitzgerald. If you want to become a patron and get in on some of that care package goodness, as well as other merching community-based benefits, you can do that at patreon.com slash the wildlife. Also, wherever you're listening, please leave us a rating and a review. If you want to leave us a rating and review on Podchaser, it's sort of the IMDB of podcast, please do. The great thing about that is we can actually reply to your ratings. So just a little bit more connection there. Okay, thank you for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay inside. Stay home.